Father, we thank you tonight. We worship you and bless your name. We thank you because we can call you Father because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because of the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And because of your spirit bearing witness with our hearts that we are your children. Father, we pray that tonight you speak to us as your own children. Bless your people, Lord. May we hear what the Spirit is saying to the church at this time. And as we hear, may we arise to do what you want us to do. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I count it a great privilege that the members of the body of Christ here will deem it fit to grant me an opportunity to share with you and I come not like somebody who knows everything but who is following the Lord step by step and who feels that by the grace of God what I'm learning I can share with other children of God and we can learn together. Now it's been called a talk but in a fashion of the conservative and old-time Christian Union body that I used to know, I'll take some time not just to preach, but to teach, to go to the Word of God. Because if you know the roots, and you know the origin, and you know the background of Nifes in this country, Nifes was committed to teaching the Word of God. And that's what I'm going to try to do tonight and just go from the word of God, from part of the word of God to another part, comparing scripture with scripture on what it means to redeem the time and to walk wisely. In Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 14, Wherefore, he says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. In Romans chapter 13, from verse 11. And that knowing the time, that it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is past spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, nor in chambering and wantonness, nor in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. In Colossians Chapter 4, reading from verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. In these New Testament passages I've read to you, we are called upon to take a proper estimate of time, to have just views of the value of time, to maintain an understanding of the design of God for which time was given, and then to live wisely. You'll see very clearly in all these passages that the Lord has linked up redeeming the time, buying up the time, purchasing the time, 
making the best of opportunities or recovering, rescuing time from waste. It links that with how we live, how we work. And it, lives, it leads that or links that with our behavior. It says because we know the shortness of time and we have a deep conviction of the nearness of eternity, we are to awake and walk. Walk honestly. Walk circumspectly. In Ephesians, it said, awake from sleep and live. You see, in our lives, we sleep every day, we sleep every time. And you know this about sleeping. That even though we are living while sleeping, yet we are insensible to any danger that may be near. We are unconscious of what may be going on around us. We are forgetful of our real character and condition. That's why Paul the Apostle said, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise and live, and walk in the light as Christ gives you light. And he links that up with walk circumspectly and live as a wise person. Now we know that sinners don't understand anything of redeeming the time and living wisely. But as for us who are born again, as for us who are children of God, we are called upon to walk carefully, guard against the temptations around us, and live as we ought to live. Now you have seen the matter of time in these passages we have read. Redeeming the time means, as I said earlier, purchase the time, buy it up. Rescue that time. Recover that time from waste. Improve upon it for the great and important purposes for which the Lord God had given that time to us. Now when he talks about living wisely, I'm sure you know this, that the Greeks had a different view of wisdom from the Jews. The Greeks thought about knowledge that is stood up and because of that knowledge stored up, they will think or they will say they have wisdom. On the other hand, the Jews had a different view. When the Jews talked about wisdom, they were thinking about your lifestyle, your behavior, your conduct, your character. The things you do to know that you have your purpose of living. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, which we read before, let's look at it again. Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 15, it said, See then, that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now we need to understand, as evangelical Christians, that we were all born fools. But here the apostle is telling us something. He says, you are born that way, don't continue that way. It says, see that you walk wisely, carefully, cautiously, profitably, and do not walk as fools. How do fools walk? Now you find in the Psalms as well as in Proverbs, the description of the fool. Number one, we learn about the fool. He says in his heart, there is no God. Not that his utterance wipes away God. Not that a statement or ideology or philosophy makes God not to exist, but he lives as if there were no God. In Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And when we live as if there were not a God in heaven, no judge, no eyes seeing what we do, when we live for the temporal alone, as if the eternal one, the almighty one, has not created us and is not interested in our lives and is detached from our lives, we live as fools. Not only that the fool will say there is no God, he lives as if there is no God. It says in that verse 1, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Which means the statement as well as the manner of life of the fool mean the same thing. One, he says there is no God, and he goes ahead and lives just like that. 
Haven't you seen people all around us that say or act as if there is no God? And then because they do not have any consciousness of the existence of God, they may not be atheists professionally. They might not say there is no God in the real sense, but pragmatically, in a practical way, it appears they are living as if they are saying, I don't believe there is a God that sees everything that I do. And because of this, the sinner, one, he moves, he lives, independent of God. Sometimes we approach people and we say, you are a sinner. And he says, no, I'm not such a great criminal. But you know, when a person lives independent of God, however morally sound he may be, that's a sinner. That's a fool. It's not living the way God creates him. It's not living in the God-ordained manner. Like Paul the Apostle put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and in verse 14, he describes such a man as a natural man. Because he receives not the things of the Spirit of God, to him they are foolishness. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Which means then, a fool cannot appreciate, cannot understand. A fool cannot handle the word of God, the principles of righteousness, the standard of unselfishness in the word of God. Because he has not been recreated. He lives as a fool. He speaks as a fool. Not only that, you see, when people say there is no God, actually they set up themselves as a God. Do you notice people that say they do not know any God and they are not going to bow down to any God? They worship and serve themselves. Now you can see in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 12, and we're looking at verse 15. It says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. The way of a fool, right in his own eyes. It says there is no God in one breath. With the other breath, he sets himself up as a God, as a standard. He doesn't know any rule apart from the rule of his mind. He doesn't know any way apart from the way of his own tradition. He doesn't know any principle apart from the principle of selfishness by which he operates. You know what the Apostle Paul is saying? He's saying when you are saved, number one, you are saved from sin. Number two, you are saved from yourself. Number three, you are saved from the dominion of Satan because you are saved from sin, from self, from Satan. Live as a person that knows of the existence of God. A person that knows that God is right. And God is the one that sets the standard and the principle. And I am to live thereby. Don't set up yourself as your own God. Don't set up your own standard as another scripture. Don't set up your own principle as the precept of God. Bow down, bend the knee before the almighty God. Because if you don't, you'll be living and acting and talking and walking as a fool. Then it says in Proverbs chapter 14, reading at verse 9, it says, Fools make a mock at sin. Now can you see the progression of the life of a fool? One, it says, I don't recognize any other God apart from my mind. Two, it says, I do not recognize any other standard apart from what I want to do. And three, he now ridicules the word of God. He makes a mock at sin. Have you found some people that call themselves Christians and they make a mock at sin? That's exactly what Paul the Apostle is saying. He says, live circumspectly, walk circumspectly, not as fools, not like people that make a mock at sin. Well, fools have to do that because they have to cover up their foolishness. They have to cover up their evil deeds and evil habits. Therefore, they make a mock at sin. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 2, the second part of verse 2, the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Are we surprised? The tree is rotten, the fruit will be rotten. Are we surprised? The well 
is poisoned. The water coming out of it will be poisonous. Are we surprised? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And therefore this fool, saying one, there is no God. Going ahead and setting himself up as the standard, the principle, and the law for himself. And then making a mock at sin. You know what he will do? He will influence all people around him to live like he is living. He will pour out his foolishness. He will have an evil, negative influence or impact on his society. You know what Paul the Apostle is saying when he said, Do not live as fools. He says, make sure that you have a positive influence on people around you. Because if you don't, you'll be walking like the ordinary man. You'll be walking like the carnal man. You will be living a life that is not according to the calling of God for you as a believer. Now, in a large assembly like this, we shouldn't take for granted that everybody knows the Lord. In an assembly like this, we shouldn't take for granted that all of us are already wise unto salvation. That we know the points one, two, three, and 4 that makes a person to shift position and get away from the place of the fool and get to the place of the wise. Because of that, I'll take a little time and see what the Bible has to say on the call and the cry of wisdom. Now, if you're a believer for some length of time, you know that Christ is the wisdom of God. And whatever we read in the Old Testament of wisdom crying without, we can apply it to the Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God stretching out his hand and calling us and saying, do not live as a fool. You know, David said about one of the warriors in the Old Testament, he said, Abner died as a fool. And you know, it's not just for Abner alone. There are many people that are born as fools. They live as fools. They die as fools. And they're dreaming of the fool's paradise until their death. And eventually they get to a fool's place. And you don't want that to happen to you. That's why it's very important that you will hear the cry and the call of wisdom. And say, yes, Lord, when you hear that call. In Proverbs chapter 1. And in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Do you know people that will never be counseled, never be spoken to, never be given an invitation, and they never think they need anything, you know, they say, I opened my eyes as a little child, I found myself in Sunday school. They say, I've been a Christian all my life. They say, I've never done any evil. They neglect the instruction of wisdom, the word of God that says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But let me tell you this, you are not going to fear God if you do not believe that God exists. You're not going to fear God if you do not know that God's standard is final and complete. You're not going to fear God if you do not believe that God has set a day and a time when he will judge all the foolishness of men. You're not going to fear God if you do not believe that God is right, I am wrong. You know, that's the beginning of wisdom. When you know, I think I've been a good fellow, but God says I'm a sinner. He must be right, I must be wrong. I think I've been going to church since I was born, but God says it takes more than going to church. It takes you opening up your heart and preparing a place for the Lord Jesus Christ, our King, our Lord, our Savior to come in. He must be right, I must be wrong. I think that I've been my best in my community, to my people, and to the people that know my life. But God says, my best will not be able to open the pearly gates of heaven and allow me to get in. He must be right, I must be wrong. The beginning of wisdom is when you accept the word of God. When he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when you understand that if you could save yourself, if you could pull up yourself by your bootstraps, Christ will not have come. 
But he came because by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified in his sight. In the words of that songwriter, could my tears forever flow? My zeal no respite, no. All this for sin cannot atone. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. And the moment you fear the Lord, you fear the judgment of God, and you say, yes, I know Christ died for me. On the cross of Calvary, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you say yes to the Lord. Not that you are trying to clean up yourself. Not that you are trying to turn over a new leaf. Not that you are trying to live a better life. You just say, I come just as I am. Because what we cannot do for ourselves, in ourselves, the Lord can do with us and for us. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, is calling upon you. If you have not already answered that call, the Philippian jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Because if you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will confess with your mouth, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let's look at Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Second Timothy 3, 15. And that from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's what I've been talking about. That the Lord will make every one of us wise unto salvation. That if you have not taken that decision, you've never received the Lord as your personal Savior, you give yourself to the Lord and you are born again. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't let us lose trend of what we're talking about. Redeeming the time. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5. From verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now, here Paul the Apostle was bringing before the believers, I believe, three definite things. Number one, he wanted them to know life's principles. Number two, he wanted them to know limited privileges. Number three, he wanted them to know the Lord's purposes. Let's take them one by one. When he said, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. He was calling upon these believers and he was telling them this, grab or grip the principles of life. If you are going to make the best use of your time, if you are not going to waste opportunities, there's something you must do. You must see that whatever other people do, you will walk circumspectly, strictly, cautiously, carefully. Or not as fools, but you will walk as the wise. In this epistle to the Ephesians, Paul the Apostle has been developing the theology concerning the church, the body of Christ. And from chapters 1 to 3, he revealed the mysteries of the kingdom, or the unsearchable riches of Christ. But then, from chapter 4, he started talking about the behavior, the character, the lifestyle of the believer. And then he pointed out to the believers, and he said in chapter 4, verse 1, have a worthy walk. That you as a believer, you must know that there are some things that are not acceptable. You cannot live as you please. You cannot go the way you like. You must get hold of the principles of life and live thereby. In chapter 4, from verses 1 to 3, it said it will be unity work. Which means, it doesn't expect that members of the church of the living God will be living 
isolated, independent lives that will not depend or be united with other members of the body of Christ. In this same chapter 4 verse 17, he said, Yours will be a different walk. And in chapter 5 verse 2, he said, It will be a love walk. In chapter 5 verse 8, he said, It will be a walking in the light. And then in the verse we have read, Wise walk. So then, he had been talking about this lifestyle, the way that a believer will behave, the way that a believer will act or react in his life. And it is the wise person that knows the God-ordained principles of life. Let's follow this through for a moment. This Christian walk, understanding that we need to understand how to walk the Christian life. You see, sometimes when people come to the Lord, they think, that is all. I've done everything I could do. You see what I did? I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you call them back and tell them, there is still more to it. In fact, people tell us that your decision for the Lord is just about 5% of the whole deal. But then, there are other people that do not want to know anything of the rest of the 95%. They do not want to know anything of our walk in the Lord. Let me just point seven things to you concerning what the New Testament says. And most of these things, they are coming from the writings of Paul the Apostle by the Spirit of God. How we ought to walk. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore... We are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. When Paul the Apostle said, walk wisely, what did he mean? He meant, number one, walk in the newness of life. What will that mean? He says, look at your old life. Have you come to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you left the kingdom of darkness and have you come to the kingdom of light? Then forget about the old lifestyle, the life of selfishness, the life of I, mine, me, all the time. It says now you are in the kingdom. And the principle in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Christ, is so very different from the principle that they operate in the world. It says it's so different that the only way you can call, you can talk about it is to say it is a newness of life. I've been crucified then. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It is Christ that lives in me. And therefore, it says, number one, walk in the newness of life. I want you to think and meditate about this. If you say you have given yourself to the Lord honestly, can you say that you are walking in newness of life? Doesn't the Bible say, if any man is in Christ, is a new creature? Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. The challenge I bring before you tonight is that you will ask for more of the grace of God, that you will be as new as the new covenant can make you. You see, the new covenant is different from the old covenant. And the new covenant, when it begins to operate in your life, I mean the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, there's something he does for you. It makes you new. New man, new covenant, newness of life. Number two, in Romans chapter 13, verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. As Paul the Apostle called upon the Christians and he said, walk circumspectly. Now we may not understand the full meaning, the Greek of walking circumspectly, but here he breaks everything down. He says, in the day-to-day language, in the day that you and I can understand without going to seminary, It says what I mean is live an honest life, privately, publicly, with people around, with people not being around. Are you not a Christian? Don't you have the grace of God? 
has not the grace of God appeared unto us, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and teaching us we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world? Have you not tasted of the power of the world to come? Has the blood of Jesus Christ not cleansed you? If he has, then you have the divine enablement that you can live an honest life. Walk honestly. And as we begin to think in the community in which we live, the, the world in which we live, the campuses in which we are, you see a lot of dishonesty, duplicity, deceit, all around. But then he's saying, you as a Christian have a different kind of lifestyle. Walk honestly. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. He calls the believers, he says, You are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. But will you understand? It is the same faith by which we are saved. That will be kept saved. And it is that faith in God that has saved us, that will keep us in that salvation experience, and we walk by faith. If we walk by sight, we'll be moved. But to see Paul the Apostle, in fact, he couldn't have walked by sight in his Christian life. Do you know? When he came to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord saved him and rescued him on the way to Damascus, he got to Damascus, and think about it, Ananias did not feel that he had been born again. That man needed to walk by faith. And eventually in Damascus, he was uh, let out of that city in a basket. Troubles began immediately that he gave his life to the Lord. He couldn't have done anything were it not for the fact he was walking by faith. He got to Jerusalem and he said, you know, I'm a believer. I want to join the body of Christ. And the, pe the people said, no, we know your trick. We know what you are trying to do. You want to see what goes on inside the kingdom so that you can manifest that authority again and come and imprison people. They rejected him. That man needed to walk by faith. Everywhere he went, there was trouble, trial, tribulation. And he said, we are pressed out of measure. And he said, we had the sentence of death. He had persecution. He had a lot of problems. Were it not for the fact that he was walking by faith, he couldn't have made it. And the same thing I bring to you, that in our Christian lives, the challenge every time, the challenge every day, that is that you will walk by faith. In Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, if you've been a Christian for some time by now, you realize that your soul is saved, your spirit is saved, your heart is cleansed, but the body is still the same old body. You still feel hungry. You still feel thirsty. You still feel tired. More than that, you still have some temptations in the flesh that you may not be willing to confess and accept before a friend. But you see, the point here is, do not yield to that flesh. Do not yield to the temptation of the flesh. It says, do not walk in the flesh, but you walk in the spirit. You are submissive to the spirit all the time. You are guided and led by the Spirit of God all the time. Every time you are saying, what is the Spirit saying to the church? And what is the Spirit saying to me as a member in the church? How will he want me to live? Because the Bible says it is the law of the Spirit of life that has set me free from the law of sin and death. And it is because we are led of the Spirit, energized by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, held by the Spirit, endued by the Spirit's power, that we're able to live the life He wants us to live. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 2, it says, Walk in love, as Christ also has loved us. Let's stop right there. What a high standard. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we who are Christians and we read some of these Bible passages. We read and pass through. We do not understand what exactly the Lord is saying. Uh, you know, it will take us a long time here 
I'm, I'm trying to tell you what uh, Paul the Apostle meant by saying, walk circumspectly. Walk in the newness of life. Walk honestly. Walk by faith. Walk in the spirit. Walk in love. And then he says, as Christ also has loved us. Now, have you ever noticed that Christ's love is one-way love? It's not trade by butter. It's not, now, you, you are giving your life to me. Now, if you will do this and do this and do this, I will love you more. You know, sometimes when we're teaching Sunday school to these little, little children in our churches, and we tell the children, now, children, don't make a noise. Be quiet. Don't play rough. Now, if you are quiet and you do not play rough, Jesus will love you. That's one of the greatest false doctrines you can teach to children. Because Jesus doesn't love them because they are quiet. Otherwise, they'll be buying their way through. If we adults cannot buy our way through to the kingdom of God, I guess the children cannot buy their way through to the kingdom of God. His love is a one-way love. While we were yet enemies, he loved us. But you know the consequence of that? The consequence of that is love as Christ has loved us. Do you realize many times our love is so much conditional? That's why we say, I love so-and-so, well, because it fulfills my condition. I don't like so-and-so, well, we're in the same Christian union, we're in the same fellowship, we're, in the, same mem we're the same members of the body of Christ, but I don't know what can get me to love that man or that woman, that brother, that sister. It's not just the kind of my, of my person. You know what you're saying? You're saying, he doesn't qualify for my love. He doesn't fulfill my condition. Now he says, change that around. Be identified with Christ. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Can I tell you something about the love of Jesus? Number one, it is sacrificial. And if you really love somebody, you will sacrifice. But uh, if you say, I'm sorry I love you so much, but uh, I know your need, but I cannot part with what I have. You must look in another direction. I doubt that love. The love of Jesus is sacrificial. Not only that, the love of Jesus is constant and consistent. There's no time to go into all this, but I'm sure you know this already yourself. That at the time that Jesus Christ was betrayed, it was a time of agony, a time of suffering. And yet the Bible says, having loved his own, he loved them until the end. Do you realize when we have a little headache, we cannot love anybody? We become self-centered and selfish. Our pains will drain our love. The headache will drain all the compassion, all the kindness. We become so touchy and sensitive because, you know, I am sick. And because maybe I didn't get on in my exam very well, I become so sensitive. I cannot love my brother. I cannot love my sister. I cannot behave like Christ that having loved his own, he loved them even to the very end. Have you noticed the way he even showed that love? They were to crucify him. They are taking him by wicked hands. And here came Peter. And he drew out a sword. And then he cut up the ear of Malchus. And I, I don't think uh, you would have paid attention. I don't know if I would have paid attention. Look, I'm facing the cross. Look, my, uh, one of my disciples has betrayed me. Look, all the lies and all the false witnesses against me. What do I care if they cut off the ear of that fellow? In fact, that fellow is a servant of the high priest. You know what he came to do? He came to take the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus will not take another step. He bent down. He took the ear. He said, don't mind, Peter. He has not understood the fullness and the completeness of love. And he gave him his ear back. That's what we're talking about. Can we love like that? like Christ, that we walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Let's do that. You know, sometimes you think you cannot, but you try and say, Lord, in myself, even though I'm born again, I can do nothing. But I want to love. I want to walk in love. 
I do not want to wait until people merit my love, until people fulfill my condition. Oh Lord, who am I? That I will set up a private, personal standard. You know, sometimes the standard you set for other people is higher than the standard you set for yourself. You excuse mistakes in your own self. Well, you say, I'm a nice guy, but once in a while I make a mistake, I'm human. But when the other fellow makes a mistake, you think that he is eternally evil because of the little mistake he has made. My brother, if you justified yourself, why can't you justify him? Why can't you justify her? Why can't you walk in love? And you know what surprised me in the life of Jesus Christ? All these disciples that followed after him. Um, you know, all the time we need to be learning about the love of Jesus Christ. He just started revealing to them and he said, I'll go to Calvary, I'll go to the cross, I'll go to Jerusalem, and I will die. And uh, Peter took him up on that statement. And he rebuked the Lord. He held him and he said, don't you say that again. And then Jesus looked at him and said, who do you think you are? I'm your Lord and Master. I'm just revealing to you my purpose of coming to this world. And he said, you do not understand the things that belong to God, but the things that be of men. But the thing that surprises me is that the very next chapter, you know what he did for Peter? He took him to the Mount of Transfiguration. That's the love we're talking about. We'll offend one another. We'll step on one another's toes. We might push one another deliberately or unintentionally, but the love of Christ, the love of Christ, number one, it is sacrificial. Number two, it is constant and consistent. Number three, it is full and it is unmerited. That's the kind of love we are to have towards our brothers and sisters. And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us. In Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, Verse 16, nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Um, this is a national uh, assembly. What I mean by that is we've come from various campuses. And you know one of the most difficult things for a Christian body to do, when you have so many, many branches, is for somebody to go on a tangent. I'll do my own thing in my own way at my own time. The way it pleases me, I don't care what the whole group feels about it. And Paul the Apostle says, do not cut out a way, a tangent for yourself. Let's all walk by the same rule. You know, it's easy to sing solo, but it's more difficult to sing with other people. It is easy, you know, to go alone and to say, I stand for what I stand upon and I will never listen to anybody. I don't want anybody to, you know, come and put his little finger in my Christian life or in my conviction or in what I want to do. Now, when you think about it, if everybody here this evening will say, I go my way, in fact, why do they have to say that this evening... Uh, uh, you know, time of fellowship and worship will start at 8 o'clock. You know, I'll be more convenient with 7.30. The other fellow said, in fact, when I eat, I like the, the thing for it to digest and I like to, you know, move around a little. And they should delay this thing about 8 till 8.30. The other fellow said, in fact, I even like the whole evening to be totally free. And you go your way. I go my way, we cannot have the body together worshipping the Lord, praising the name of the Lord. Next time you are tempted to feel independent, to go your own way, and to do whatever you want to do, would you please remember that we are counseled and exhorted that we should walk by the same rule. And you know, if we are looking at Christ, there will be no problem. If I follow Christ and you follow Christ, eventually we'll be walking in the same direction. Maybe at a times of immaturity, we may have some little slight interpretations of how we think Christ should walk. But as we mature, 
as we are patient with one another, you will discover that if I can sink my own private opinion and you can sink your private opinion for the edification of the body of Christ, and we say, after all, we have the scriptures and we can walk by the same rule, then we can live as Christ wants us to live. Number seven comes out of First John chapter 2. And verse 6. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as Christ walked. I think that's the summary of the whole thing. That if we're to walk circumspectly, if we're to walk in the newness of life, walk honestly, walk by faith, walk in the spirit, walk in love, walk by the same rule of scripture. What it means is that we are walking as Christ walked. You see, we'll not have too many problems if we can ask ourselves many times, if Christ found himself in this situation, what will Christ have done? Now, as you think about the life of Christ for a minute, do you realize he spent just a short time on earth, and yet he did everything the Father wanted him to do? Isn't that the difficulty we have? We have spent more than three and a half years. We have spent maybe more than five years in the Christian fold. And maybe some of us have only got barely started. The race that is set before us. And when you think about it, that the believers in the New Testament, they walked circumspectly. And people like Paul the Apostle could say at the end of his pilgrimage, he could say, I fought the fight. I've done everything the Lord wanted me to do. Now I'm ready. I'm ready to go. And he now counseled Timothy. And he said, now you are to do the work of an evangelist. As for me, I've ended what I ought to do. That gets me to the next point. Limited privileges. If, uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. See then that he walked circumspectly, verse 15, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Now, Greek authorities tell us that there are different words that are used for time. And it's not so much referring to the time on our clock or wristwatch here. Kairos here is referring to opportunities, privileges that we have. And we need to know that the privileges we have are so very limited. Have you ever thought about this? There are many people that never finish what they begin. There are many artists that never finish the paintings they have started. There are many people that carve things and they are never able to finish. Have you ever noticed even, you know, with the government, there are some roads they are trying to co uh, construct. They never finish. Have you ever noticed some architects and builders, they get started, they lay the foundation, they never finish. And we can say that for many, many believers, they get started, they cannot finish up. Why? Because they do not buy up time. They do not purchase time. They do not redeem time. They do not recover time. They do not rescue time from ways. They are not making the best of the opportunities that they have. They have dreams that fail to become reality. They have hope that fail to become a real fact. And if we are going to make our dreams a reality, we must do something. And it is this, redeem the time. Our time is limited on earth. And because our time is limited, we need to make the best of what we have. And it is wisdom, the wisdom of God, that leads to redeeming the time, spending that time carefully, profitably, and purposefully, determining God's purpose and fulfilling it. If we don't walk wisely now, we don't have any other time to live. Think about it. We have just one life. When we get out of the scene, other people will come in. And as you think about your own time, in the university or polytechnic or wherever you are, 
Have you ever asked yourself, why am I here at this time? Or do you think for you as a child of God, you are an accident? Some people think like that. They think that their birth is accidental. They think that their lives is accidental. They think that the college or university where they are is accidental. They think that they are belonging to a Christian body in a particular location is accidental. Have you ever noticed that God works out the plan of our lives? Do you know that you are not an accident in the kingdom of God? And do you know that where you are now on your campus, there is something that the Lord wants you to do? Maybe you have never asked the question like Paul asked the question. When he knew that it was the Lord Jesus Christ talking to him on the way to Damascus, he said, Lord, I have this question. I don't know what I will do in my life. I've done a lot of things. And you are telling me now all the things I've done with all my strength, with all my power, with all the sincerity I have within me as I've been taught as a Jewish religious fellow. You are telling me that I've been persecuting you. I've gone the wrong way. Now, what will you have me to do? Have you ever asked the Lord your purpose of existence? Why are you here? If you have never asked, it's time you ask. Because our privileges are limited to this time alone. And the believer who works in wisdom will know how to make the best of the opportunities that come his way. He will have a sense of urgency because it is an evil time. Let's look at this verse closely. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. If you follow through what we have as internal evidence in the epistle, you will discover that from chapter 4, Paul the Apostle spoke about these people that had the slate of men with cunning craftiness, wanting to deceive the children of God, Ephesians 4.14. And it says, because of the evil of deception, because of the evil of false prophets, because of the evil of false teaching, redeem the time. In verse 17 of that same chapter, it talks about the vanity of the Gentiles. And if you know anything about Ephesus, you will know that there was a lot of vanity. Haven't you read in Acts of the Apostles? When they cried out for two whole hours, Diana is the great goddess they believed in. And Paul the Apostle said, because of the evil time, because of the vanity, because of the emptiness, because of the thing that will sap your energy, and you don't have any gain at the end of the day, because of that, redeem the time. And then he talked about the people that are darkened and alienated from the life of God, the people that are totally blind and ignorant. He said, the days are evil. All around you, you have ignorance, you have blindness, you have alienation from the life of God. Because of that evil, he says, you must redeem the time. He spoke about the devil coming, and they must not give place to the devil. He spoke about all the evil things, the licentiousness, the evil, the immorality in chapter 5. And he said, because of the evil, redeem the time. Let's look at the campuses. Can't we say the same thing on the campuses? False doctrine, false religion, false influence on the campuses, because of that evil, redeem the time. Can't we say the same thing about the alienation of people from God, about the blindness and the ignorance and the darkness on the campuses? Because of that, redeem the time. Can't we say about, you know, the immorality? Can't we say something about the drunkenness, the deep pottery that goes along, uh, uh, that goes on on the campuses? Because of the evil, redeem the time. Not only that, you know, just a few years after this, Jesus gave a message to John, to this same Ephesian church, and he said, you have lost your first love. Little did they know that the things that were happening around them, the evil of the time, could make them to lose their first love. And he said, because of that, redeem the time. Make the best of the opportunities that you have right now. Now history tells us, that about a hundred years after this time, 
killings, burnings took place. That is, bad emperors, terrible, evil emperors were killing the Christians. And as Paul the Apostle looked ahead, he said, time is short. Look at things in your immediate vicinity. Look at things just a little bit far off. And look at a century from now because of the days of evil upon you. Redeem the time. We do not know the future. Here is your best opportunity. Now that you have the light, walk in the light. Now that you have the privilege, make use of the privilege. Now that you know the purpose of God for your life, walk according to that purpose of God for your life. We have limited privileges because we have limited time. In fact, long ago, before this time, the psalmist told the Lord that he will help him to be wise and to number his days in Psalm 90. Psalm 90, verse 4 and verse 12. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night, verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. As you think about the many things that attract your attention on the campus, your academic work, your Christian profession, and the responsibilities and the activities of uh, the Christian body on the campus, and clubs and side attractions and distractions, and a lot of things, you'll need to tell the Lord like David did. Lord, teach us to number our days. You know, in my own university days, as I look back now, I can see that some of us, uh, those days, we pass through without making any mark. Some people... They just fly through, like a bird through the air, and you cannot trace the path they went through. You don't want to be like that. You want to leave a positive influence behind. You want to leave a good name behind. You want to leave a fruitful life and ministry behind. Not only that, you want to even make what you're doing now a springboard for the thing that the Lord will want you to do in your life, to glorify his name. But if you never think about it, if you never have an agenda, a plan, if you never know that the time you are living now has been loaned to you, given to you, so that you can use it purposefully, profitably for the Lord, you do not know that the privilege is limited. The time, the opportunities will be squandered. In Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life down to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul the Apostle, he knew his calling. From the time that the Lord called him and he said, I will show him the things that he will suffer for my sake, he could say later, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. Have you ever had a body? A vision? Have you known the will of God? Have you known the purpose of your existence? Do you know what the Lord wants you to do to glorify his name? Are you at it? Have you started? Or are you allowing things to distract you? Paul the apostle said, Revelations come. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, I look at some Pentecostals or Charismatics and they rule their lives by revelations. And they do not allow the purpose of God to be fulfilled in their lives. But you know, if anybody was Charismatic, I think Paul the Apostle was Pentecostal. I think Paul the Apostle was. But you know what he said? He said in verse 23, Save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in Every city that burns and affliction abide me. You see, everywhere he went, somebody will rise up and give a word of revelation and say, Paul the Apostle, here is the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord says, if you go to that city, burns, affliction, imprisonment, peril, everything is waiting for you. 
No, that's all right. That's a word from the Lord. But that word of the Lord doesn't say, don't go. It just says, if you go, this is what will happen. And some people misinterpreted that, and they began to cry. And they said, Paul, you dare not go. Now, it depends on what you are doing with this revelation. What you are doing with this saying that they call a word from the Lord. But Paul the Apostle said, I don't doubt the Spirit. I don't quench the Spirit. Neither am I neglecting or negating the prophecy, but none of these things move me. I signed up for that when I joined the Christian race. Affliction, bonds, imprisonment, suffering. Well, he said, I rejoice in it all. I sing in the prison. I write in the prison. All, many of the epistles that he wrote, he wrote in the prison. And you know, whenever he told the people to pray for him, he did not say, now you pray for me, I'm in this dungeon, I'm in this affliction. The Spirit of God revealed it, and I didn't know what to do with that revelation. And you know I'm suffering now. You pray that, you know, I will, you know, be able to live out to the end. I will not suffer too much. And, you know, in the prison here, the food is not so nice that they will give me food. Never. You know what he prayed for? He, he said they should pray for him. That in the dungeon, in the prison, he will have a, a door of utterance, and he will open his mouth with boldness. Now with Paul the Apostle, it doesn't matter where it is. In a house, at the seashore, in the prison, wherever. The only thing is that I have determined and decided this is the plan and the purpose of God for me and nothing will move me. Now, have you, have you been moved? You know the will of God? The plan of God? The purpose of God? What is it you are to do for the Lord? And yet, a little problem, a little persecution, a little misunderstanding, a little lie against you, a little false witness against you, then you say, well, I wanted to serve the Lord before. I wanted to be part of the musicians, you know, in our Christian union before. But you see, they will not accept my ministry. I wanted to, you know, be part of the people that will be going out to secondary schools and evangelize. But you know, the people will not allow me. I wanted to give, you know, my talent in writing uh, in, our, in our college. But, you know, the people will not accept. And because of all these troubles, you see, no money, no school fees, no pocket money. I did this, I did that. And even the brethren, they're looking at me as if I'm a second-rate Christian. Because of that, I must be careful what I do in the fellowship. You don't have the kind of thing that Paul the Apostle had. You know what the, what Paul the Apostle said? He said, I don't care. They are still arguing in Jerusalem concerning circumcision. It doesn't move me. I don't care. Forty people will bind themselves together and they will say they will neither eat or drink until they have killed me. I don't care. I'm being told that as I go shipwreck and robbers and all that, they're waiting for me. I don't care for that. Only one thing I care for, that I might finish my course with joy. That's the important thing. Find out what the course is. Find out what the ministry is. Finish it up. And I believe the grace of God is available. We can finish it up. And if we have not started, we can get started tonight. After all, it is all by grace. Didn't you hear Paul the Apostle? He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And the Lord assured him. He said, Paul, I know what you are going through, but my grace is sufficient for you. And tonight, we can encourage ourselves. Doesn't the Lord know what we are going through? Doesn't he know our background, our predicament, our problem? And yet he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Let's look at point three. The Lord's purposes. In Ephesians chapter five, Ephesians chapter five, looking at verse 17, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Brothers and sisters, from the things we have shared together, we need to understand. Now, it doesn't matter where we live, what we're going through. It doesn't matter the persecution or the problem. It doesn't matter the needs in our lives. What matters is, am I at the center of the will of God? 
That's all that matters to a Christian. Now, we'll have persecution because the Bible says all that will live godly will suffer persecution. That doesn't matter. In it all, we can rejoice and we can say, Lord, what gives me joy? What gives me satisfaction? What gives me fulfillment is that I know that I am not outside the will of God. What I do, what I say, where I go, the way I live my life, the things I'm committed to, the things I'm addicted to, the things I've consecrated my life for, I know it is the will of God for me, for now. And I leave the future in your hand. All that I want is that the Lord's purpose for now is being fulfilled in my life. And as the days go by, every step of the way, he will guide my step. And it is one thing to have a sense of urgency and buy up the time, redeem the time, purchase the time, or recover the time from waste. It's another thing to be profitably profitably engaged in the direction that God wants you to be engaged. And all that I'm saying tonight, I hope you don't uh, think that I'm saying multiply activities. Uh, you know there are people that multiply activities, but then they are not very fruitful. It is not that you multiply activities. Determine the will of God and do it. If you don't, it says, why call ye me Lord, Lord? And do not the things that I say. But if you are willing to do the will of God, and the only problem is that you are thinking, I don't have strength. I don't have the ability. Now, who has? Nobody has. He told all those disciples that followed him for more than three years. He said, without me, you can do nothing. And he sent Paul to tell us and to tell them, with Christ, through Christ, we can do all things. And I tell you tonight, you may not be able to do much or even anything in your own strength. But through Christ, you can do all things. Therefore then, in your life, determine what is the life principle by which you are to walk. How are you to walk in your life? Circumspectly, honestly. And you are to walk in love. And you are to walk like Christ walked. And you are to walk in the spirit but not in the flesh. You are to walk in faith. You have to walk in the newness of life. Determine that and say, Lord, I need your grace for that tonight. Then your limited privileges already. M much water has gone under the bridge. Much time has been wasted. Many privileges and opportunities have been lost. It's time we told the Lord, oh Lord, will not allow that to happen again. Give us the sense of urgency, dedication, devotion, sacrifice, so that at every opportunity, we'll be doing what you want us to do. Determine the purpose of God for your life. Ask him for his grace and live thereby. Shall we rise up and pray together? I want you to talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord will help you. To redeem the time and to live wisely.